Okay, good. So here we are, guys. You are watching a premiere of this because Mrs. Danielle, this is my guest, Mrs. Danielle Walsh. She is here for um, our special anniversary. They came up for the weekend. So it was real nice having her here. And I had wanted to do a Gently Led Sisters with her. And we'll kind of get into it. Um, you tell a little bit on your, well, go ahead and introduce yourself. So my name is Danielle. Um, my husband is Jeremy and we have three kids, um, Eleora, Naomi, and Ariel. That's this one. <laughs> um, See, it's pretty. How old are they? Four and a half, two and a half, and a half. So she's almost eight months old. <laughs> Do they all have blue eyes? Oh. Um, my my middle one has brown. Okay, because you have brown eyes. Yeah. Okay, so the reason that I wanted to have Danielle on is she has a very neat story that we're going to talk about. And this might be a shorter episode. I don't know. We'll see how long it goes. But the reason that I wanted her on was because of this video that I'm going to share screen. Okay, I'm going to share my screen with you guys. One year ago today, I walked into the emergency department. I was 14 weeks pregnant. I expected to be given a bag of IV fluids and sent home with a few more eye rolls. Instead, they told me I also had cancer and needed to have an abortion in order to start chemotherapy right away. I was admitted to the ICU. Without treatment, I wouldn't have lasted much longer. I was at a very high risk of cardiac arrest. I was scared for my baby. I thought about the account of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how they were thrown into the furnace that was so hot that it killed the men who threw them in. And when they came out, not only were they unharmed, but they didn't even smell like smoke. I prayed and asked others to pray that my baby would be protected that thoroughly in my womb, that there would be no sign of harm on her. Ariel is now a healthy six-month-old baby girl, and I am in remission. I want to share our story so that pregnant women facing a cancer diagnosis, their loved ones, and the medical providers who see these patients will know that it's possible to treat them without resorting to abortion, and that there is hope. So as you can see, that is why it got my interest. So we're going to talk a little bit about your story. So you said you went in at 14 weeks. What kind of symptoms were you having? Okay, so yeah, when when I'm pregnant, I have hyperemesis. Okay. And so I, mm -hmm. you know, I was regularly going like 24 or even 48 hours without being able to keep anything down mm -hmm. at all. And oh, so, oops, it restarted. <laughs> Okay. okay sorry about that <laughs> okay go ahead so you weren't able to keep anything down right so i just went in for iv fluids and they just sort of they don't really get it because like morning sickness is normal when you're pregnant mm -hmm. and so they're like that's normal and i'm like it's not normal to go like 48 hours straight but they don't listen they think you're being dramatic right and then they hand you paper saying like come in if it's been more than 12 hours mm -hmm. but anyway so you know and months, months before, several months before I even got pregnant, I had been having like tachycardia. And so I went in and they gave me um, a heart monitor for mm -hmm. like, that just stayed attached for like two weeks. Is that like a irregular rhythm, rhythm of the heart or what exactly is that? It was like a monitor that you just like, it stays like taped to your chest for two but weeks. But you were having problems with what, with your heart? Yeah, it would just okay. randomly start beating like super fast. Okay. And they told me like, you know, they looked at the results and they said, you know, everything looks normal. Just like, it's like a nuisance thing. Like, don't worry about it. Right. And so, and I had mentioned that I also had like some pain, like, and I'm like, I don't know if it's my heart or if it's my lung, like, you know, it might be nothing type mm -hmm. thing. Right. And so, and then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. And so yep. I tried to like sort of get follow up and it just sort of, it was, it just, sort of didn't really happen and I was like okay whatever it's probably so it started out with heart problems basically or heart or irregular rhythm and then yeah. you said pain you were having a little bit of pain oh I gave it to her it's okay oh okay <laughs> <laughs> give her something to play with while she's sitting here <laughs> yeah well so anyway you know um trying to think that's okay so it's hard to think back about all this stuff yeah because it was a while ago at this point mm -hmm. but anyway you know my heart rate just sort of kept 
you know, getting kind of faster. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this can't really be normal because, mm -hmm. you know. And so I went and I talked to a doctor because I was talking to her about like the hyperemesis and stuff. And she was trying to figure out how to help me. And I told her also like, you know, I had like a cough when I lied down. Okay. And it just kept getting worse. Like mm. when I laid down, I would cough. And it's like, I can't even like sleep. It, it got to a point where like, I couldn't even sleep at night. Mm -hmm. And like, you ever like open a jar or a bottle or something. And mm -hmm. there's like, sort of like a, a whizzing sound. Mm -hmm. Like my lung was making that oh, sound. Okay. And so I told the doctor this and she's like, yeah, it sounds like maybe you have silent reflux. Maybe you okay. have a hiatal hernia. Mm -hmm. Um, it might be good to go to the chiropractor and see if you can sort of like, you know, adjust things and maybe right. that'll help with the hernia. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay. And you know, I had also told her like, I'm super, super out of shape. And I figured that's because I'm not eating or drinking because I'm just throwing everything right. up and I'm not mm -hmm. sleeping. So of course I'm exhausted. Right. But you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also when she mentioned the chiropractor, I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I needed to make a chiropractic appointment anyway, because mm -hmm. my shoulder was hurting super bad and I don't know what I did to my shoulder. <laughs> so I go to the chiropractor and he's like, this sounds like a lung problem, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And the doctor just, she just forgot to listen to my lungs. So mm -hmm. after going to the chiropractor, she forgot to listen to your lungs. <laughs> yeah. I, Cause doctors are human too. Yes. Yeah. You know? And so I, the chiropractor's like, this sounds like a lung problem. And I had gone like, you know, a full day without keeping anything down again. Mm. And so I tried to go to the urgent care mm -hmm. and they said, well, we're out of IVs. And, um, you know, I, I had Did tried to have a doctor or midwife at this time, like an yeah. OBGYN or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But oh, she's, she's like, no, nope, mm -mm, not taking it. <laughs> um, you know, I tried to make an appointment to go in and get like an IV just like in the office. And they said, well, I got a triage nurse on the phone. And she said, we don't, you know, it's too late to get you in today. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it sounds like you maybe should go in. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'm just going to refer you to the ER. Just go to the ER. I didn't want to go to the ER because they act like I'm wasting their time when I go in. Yeah. And so I went in and they're like, your resting heart rate is 141. And wow. I'm like, yeah, it does that. Do you have like an answer for wow. that? Like, are you yeah, going to look that's at like that? me after a really, 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 really hard workout? <laughs> yeah. Well, so <laughs> I've just been sort of being told all this stuff was normal the whole time. And right. so I'm like, okay, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and so then they're like, we need to give you a chest x-ray. And I'm like, I'm pregnant. I like, mm. you know, right. I was afraid of the x-ray a little yeah. did I know. Right. And so then they took the x-ray and they told me you have an enlarged heart Oh. and you have a lot of fluid mm. in your right lung. So we need to do a CAT scan. Mm. And then I was just, you know, still worried. Okay. I didn't want to do the CAT scan, but it's like, you have to at that point, you know? Right. And so I took the CAT scan and they said, okay, it's not an enlarged heart. You have a tumor. There's, oh yeah. <laughs> they're like, there's a large mass in your chest. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, okay. So cancer. Okay. You know, <laughs> were you all by yourself at this time? Yes, because of COVID. Yeah, so know. my husband was with my other two kids mm -hmm. and, you know, they weren't allowed to come in. And so, right. you know, I had to tell my husband over FaceTime that I had cancer Oh man. and, you know, I'm asking him, I'm like, how large is the mass? They're like, we can't tell you that, but it's not small. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that's scary. So I, you know, and one of the doctors told me like, you know, this is going to be very complicated. We're going to transfer you to main campus and we're going to figure this out. And I'm like, okay, you know, we're mm -hmm. going to figure this out. Um, and so, you know, my husband like gave the kids to his parents, which was a blessing that they could, you know, be there for the kids and make things a little more normal for them. Because at this point, you know, Naomi was just a year and a half old mm -hmm. and she, she was not weaned yet. 
She oh. was used to nursing to bed every oh, night. Oh, that would be tough. And so then I wound up in the hospital for 12 oh. days straight where oh. she couldn't see me at all except yeah. for FaceTime. So then she was weaned. Then she was weaned. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough and, way to wean though. Yeah. And when she finally saw me after 12 days without mm -hmm. mommy, I, I had to tell her no, because oh. I had started chemotherapy at that point. Right. So right. But now I'm like kind of jumping around, I guess. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. We'll come back to it. But no, that's just really sad though, especially when someone else has your baby and you have to wean that way. I like to wean gradually, you know, not cold turkey like that. So that's tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So you were in the hospital 12 days and what did they find during that 12 days? So at that point they were just, a lot of it, they were just trying to figure out what I had. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they gave me a biopsy and we had to wait to get, we had to wait a couple of days to get the biopsy. And I was in ICU for mm -hmm. most of the time. Wow. Um, because yeah, so the mass, it was like the size of a grapefruit in my, wow. in my chest. So that's why you were having problems. Like, so I forget the exact measurements, but it was like nine point something centimeters by 10 point something centimeters by 12 point something centimeters, Wow. which, you know, when you're smushed next to your right. Head. And it was also wrapped around my right pulmonary artery. Wow. So, you know, I asked my oncologist, I'm like, you know, like how, long would I have lasted if mm -hmm. I hadn't come in when I had come in? Right. Just, and she's like, I'm glad you came in when you did, because mm -hmm. you know, you were at a really high risk of cardiac arrest. And <laughs> now I created a demon. Now she's got it. Now she's yeah. not going to give it up. <laughs> but you know, they took, I had to have a chest tube to get like the fluid out of my lung. Right. And yeah. Sorry for the sake of the timeline. This is all over the place. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> no, that's fine. So no, we got the main gist. You went in the ER. They ended up doing all the stuff, the tests. They found yeah. out you have a large mass. So then they come in and what do they tell you you need to do? And kind of went over that in your story. But, right. So they were trying to figure out how to, well, they were telling me, you know, the whole time that I had to have an abortion. Right. Most of the doctors were mm -hmm. telling me you have to have an abortion. Mm -hmm. You, you know, chemotherapy targets rapidly dividing cells. A baby is rapidly dividing cells. Like you, this isn't going to work, you, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, I'm just scared for my baby. You know, like at this point, I don't even care that I have cancer. I'm just afraid of right. what's going to happen to my baby because the doctors have what's best in their mind. And they're not listening to the fact that right. The baby is the priority to me because mm -hmm. one of the doctors even told me they're like the baby's not my patient you're my patient right and i'm like well <laughs> so much mm -hmm. for my body my choice right right because mm -hmm. that was not what i wanted as right. a patient you know yeah, you can so they said you need to abort you need to abort yeah because they're like we're gonna have to give you chemotherapy we're gonna right. have to you know one of the doctors is like you have to have a PET scan. You have to. And I didn't have a PET scan and that was fine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we did MRI without contrast and mm -hmm. that was fine, you know. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. It was just sort of like an uphill battle because, like, they had to diagnose me and they, in their mind, the baby's going to die. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, I know you have to do testing to treat me but we need to do testing that's not going to hurt the baby. And they like, didn't mm -hmm. look, really care about that. Right. So like, you know, I had two biopsies because the first one failed. And so when I went in for the second biopsy, they had transferred me to the main campus at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and the doctor came in who was going to do the biopsy. And, you know, I, I, I wanted to make sure that everything was on the same page. So I'm like, you know that I'm pregnant. Right. And he's mm -hmm. like, you're still pregnant, we're going to have to do the procedure differently then. Mm. And so you really have to advocate for yourself mm -hmm. every step of the way, because, right. You know, are there great doctors who listen? Yes. But are there also doctors who think they know what's best and are going to do things their own way? Yes. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, there's, you know, people tend to just like blindly trust doctors. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying all doctors are bad. Of course, there are great doctors, but you got to realize that everybody's human, you know? Right. Yeah. And that's the thing too. I just, I feel like, um, I've read many, many stories where women decide to have abortions because they find out 
a cancer diagnosis or something like that. And I think doctors just nowadays just expect, well, she'll just get rid of it. You know, she's not going to try to carry this baby, you know, full term or whatever. Right. So um, when they decided to do the, the chemotherapy, now, you did you just do chemotherapy while you were pregnant with her? Did they, mm-hmm. they didn't try to shrink the mass like by radiation or anything? Or did they try to do radiation? No. Um, I mean, with technologies, advancements and everything, like different doctors do things differently. Mm -hmm. What my oncologist recommended was that we didn't actually need to do the radiation, but I had asked, you know, a bunch of questions like, can we do surgery? And he's like, no. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, you know, and part of it, I don't know. They went to, they told me they were going to have a uh, meeting to discuss my case. And I'm like, can I, come to the meeting Mm -hmm. you know and they said no you can't come to the meeting because like we we discuss multiple patients at these meetings and so you Um, can't be there and i just swear they're discussing you and you can't even be there yeah well and Mm -hmm. because there's also the assumption that i'm like this religious bumpkin who doesn't know anything (sighs) because i'm trying not to kill my baby right and so they like they you know I don't know. I feel like not all of them. I, mm-hmm. I'm not painting all of them with this picture. I had great doctors right. involved in my care mm-hmm. and, you know, they helped us through it, but there was, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Right. And I feel like in a situation like this, this is where you've been pro-life, you know, obviously you want children, mm-hmm. you know, as many children as God will give you. And it comes to when the rubber meets the road, this is where you have to really decide, am I pro-life? Am I totally pro-life? And a lot of people in the world would look at this as, well, you're not because, you know, you were sacrificing your own, you know, health or whatever to not get maybe the treatment that you needed because you were pregnant. Was there any talk of delaying treatment until you had, or was it, was it so, was it pressing into your organ or your heart so much that you had to do something then? I, there wasn't any time to wait Mm -hmm. to do anything. Right. I had tried, you know, um, a lot of you are familiar with Paul Wittenberger and (sighs) you've maybe seen, you know, some of like, like the Gerson therapy, if you're familiar with that at all. Mm -hmm. And I had contacted the Gerson practitioner and they told me, you know, that I was contraindicated (sighs) to do that. And, you know, like the doctor told me this tumor, like, is not a friend of time. I forgot exactly how he said it, but it's like, Mm -hmm. it takes a little bit of time to kick in and doing anything else. Like it just needed to be treated immediately. (laughs) Exactly. So the chemotherapy that you decided to do, um, what, what exactly was that? What exactly type of care? I know there's different types of chemotherapies that you can do. Did you decide, did you and your doctors decide on one that you thought would be okay for the baby. I mean, how does that work? Well, it's, it's just sort of the chemotherapy that was, um, that you would do anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, ironically, it's considered safe during pregnancy and the doctors just didn't know that oh. they didn't look up the statistics until I had refused multiple times. And they, mm-hmm. <laughs> they looked it up and they're like, we looked it up and actually it's not that bad. Mm. It's not even that bad. And I'm like, at this point, I just don't trust them, you know, but exactly. Um, but yeah, um, she's getting sleepy. You know, one of our friends who has been in, who has some history in the medical field was, you know, helping talk me through it and stuff. And mm-hmm. she told me mm-hmm. she probably wants to stand up. Oh, if I stand up, I'm out of frame. So. That's okay. You can go back a little bit else. Okay it up a little bit mm-hmm. there we go she we'll do whatever me, works <laughs> she had told me that like you know the antibiotic cipro has worse fetal outcomes than the chemo regimen that they wanted me on okay so i think i've actually looked the antibiotic two up that you said and um doesn't it have a black box warning even yeah yeah i'm not saying that makes chemo great I'm just, uh-huh. <laughs> it kind of makes right. me more scared of the antibiotic too yes but- it does <laughs> I'd be scared of the antibiotic for sure. So you prayed at the beginning of this, that God would just protect your baby. Mm -hmm. God would not. And I mean, by all means. So by the time that you had her, you're going through this chemotherapy on top of the, um, the throwing up and everything that you did, did you have to get IVs and things? I mean, was it, 
was it, were you able to keep anything down combined with the chemotherapy? Well, I was previously unmedicated for the high pharmacist, and so they gave me medication. And at this point, I'm like, okay, yeah, I do. What, when was she born? Like how many months into, was she considered full term? Oh, she was born at 39 weeks. Nice. And she was just, <laughs> aw. <laughs> aw. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you want this to turn into a birth story too, or if that's too much. Oh, of a tangent, no, it's or... not. It's not too much of a tangent. All the everyone watching is like moms, so we yeah. like birth stories, <laughs> don't we? We do. Okay. Well, so do. <laughs> so she was my third born, and so I had, you know, in my mind an idea of what labor is like, oh, and she God. sort of did something else. Ah! Everyone's different. Even my number eight was totally different than any of them. So yeah. her birth was completely different. Yeah. So, you know, I actually went to the OB like the, <laughs> the morning that she was born, but I just sort of didn't really think anything of it. I felt a, like a lot of pressure and I just was like, you know, it, it didn't feel like contractions. You know, I talked to the OB and whatever. So I went home and then like <laughs> the pressure started to have a pattern Yeah. and it didn't feel like what I what I remembered contractions to feel like. So it's like, oh, I have really uncomfortable pressure that's going on and off. I think these are contractions and how do I not know what contractions feel like? Cause this is my third child, but it was mm -hmm. different, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the contractions were coming at, and it just only felt like pressure to me. Mm -hmm. And so then we called my husband's parents to come pick up the kids and you know, by the time um, they came to pick up the kids, like she, um, grandma walked in and I'm like, my water broke. Oh, <laughs> that was fast. And I, you know, I tried calling the OB and it like didn't go through. And, you know, I think, you know, really grandma came and got the kids out just in time. And so, you know, at one point I'm like, I told my husband, call an ambulance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he did. And, you know, they walk in the door and like, when they're opening the door, I'm like, I'm pushing. And so, yeah. Wow. And then that really caught me by surprise because then I had six masked men in my bedroom. Right. <laughs> yeah. That was not what I had signed Were up for. Were you planning a home birth? No, no, <laughs> no, because I had gone through chemotherapy my whole pregnancy. Right, and exactly. So I was, normally I'm all for home birth, but like yeah. it just seemed a little more, yes. than, more than a little questionable. So, exactly. So, you know, but they came in and, and labor is weird. So I was trying to speak at a normal volume, but it was coming out as screaming. Mm. And so they were like, Ma'am, you need to calm down. Oh, that's funny. And telling that to a woman <laughs> having a baby. Come on. Come on. What were they yeah. thinking? Well, yeah. And so anyway, you know, they like put me on the stretcher and I'm like pushing while they carry me to the ambulance. And then, you know, they put me onto the ambulance and my husband's like trying to drive separately to drive to the hospital. Right. And um, then, you know, they're, they keep checking me and they're like, do you, you know, is she crowning? No. Is she crowning? No. Is she crowning? Yes. And they're like, do you want the dad? I'm like, yes. <laughs> and so they went and whoops, they went and, and got him and, you know, he came back and she was already born. Um, so he missed it, unfortunately. Oh, so she was born in the ambulance? She was born in the ambulance. Oh, that's Funny. before it even started moving oh like, oh my goodness <laughs> yeah right outside our house so oh it was... that's so funny man you were just she's one for the books i'm telling you yeah everything that you went through with her that is hilarious and then her umbilical cord was like in a double knot too <laughs> oh <laughs> wow was... i've had one with single knots but not double yeah wow you that's crazy so after you had her by this point you've been through um chemotherapy for what six months or so mm-hmm five months, give or take. So did they discover, did you keep on doing chemotherapy after she was born or? No, um, the timing just so happened to work out that I went through the full six months of chemotherapy, like from, from like, 
how was it? I think I was about 16 weeks when I started. Okay. Ish, because I was like 14 ish when I right. went in and in the hospital for 12 days. Mm-hmm. So I was around 16 when I started. Okay. And then I think I was like, uh, well, okay. My last chemo was January 11th and she was born nine days later. Yeah. So. Okay. And by that time, if the mass was gone, it shrunk it that much. It wasn't gone, but it was dormant. I okay. Don't know. They said okay. it's basically like, I still had one like the size of a ping pong ball in there. Like they said like, like four centimeters, but at that point, like, you know, when she was five weeks old, I had a PET scan mm-hmm. and they could tell that it was not metabolically active. Okay. So they said it's kind of like a scar. Oh, interesting. That's a miracle though. And according to, I mean, did they do, did they have to do tests on her to see is she okay? Or was it just kind of assume that she was fine when she was I mean, born? They weren't too worried about her. They wanted to do like a ultrasound of her heart. Okay. At some point. Mm-hmm. But then the pediatrician's like, well, if you want to, we can do that. I don't think we need to. Um, I so. mean, she's saying, look at her. She's <laughs> perfectly perfect in every way. Yeah. So what would your advice be to women that are facing this? They have this cancer diagnosis, they're pregnant, they're in their second, you know, first, second trimester. Now it's a game. First, second trimester, whatever. What would be your advice to them? Okay. Well, um, I mean, you got to do whatever you're comfortable with. You know, I'm not a doctor, obviously. Mm -hmm. What I would I mean, what I did was I tried to look into the Gerson therapy first and contacted a practitioner to see if that was Mm -hmm. a good idea for me. And it wasn't, I was contraindicated, but that's what I would have done um, if I had had the option. Mm -hmm. And then there's also um, a foundation called Hope for Two, and they are a great resource. So if you're, if you're pregnant and you have a cancer diagnosis, then Dr. Cardonic is the expert to to help you through that and help you know what's what's going to be safest for mom and baby what your options are right good i can't imagine um being faced with that with the whole you know having a cancer diagnosis but as you can see you know i think she's a miracle i think it's a miracle that you went through that yeah you were you did chemotherapy and all that and she came out you know like she did so so we're probably going to wrap it up just because she's getting fuzzy. <laughs> so thank you very much for sharing your story. If you guys have any other questions, if we skipped around a bunch, sorry, you know, we had the baby and everything. So just leave the question down below. Um, definitely ask her anything. She'll try to answer it. I think we got the gist of it though. You know, just the, the fear and the concern, obviously when you're diagnosed, you know, at 14 weeks with this cancer. And I truly believe that God protected her. I mean, just like, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire and furnace. Yeah, I truly believe that God did protect her. And it's amazing that we even have medicines that will shrink the tumor, but yet she was okay. That's amazing to me that we do. So thank God for the ones that have researched that. But we will talk to you guys uh, later. And thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> Say bye-bye. Say bye-bye. Say bye-bye like whatever.